Okay, um, we'll start the session now. Um, welcome uh, to you and welcome to our, our, our presenters, uh, Lord Stern and uh, Himanshu, uh, uh, who are coming here today. Um, I'm David Hume, the Executive Director of the Global Development Institute, and it's a really um, special privilege for me to be able to uh, introduce uh, Nicholas uh, and Himanshu uh, 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 and, uh, and chair this session. Um, I can't believe the audience is so small, so I'm really trying to work out what the hell's going on. Can I ask you to come down, though, so that we can be a bit more intimate and a bit less uh, spread on this? I don't know whether Lev Cisse is doing a poetry session or something. I know he's in the university today, but um, this, yeah, this is not what I'd anticipated, because we've got absolutely major accounts uh, coming up to, uh, tonight about change in India. India is not a significant uh, player in the global economy. About the way in which uh, studying change can allow one to interrogate theories of development, theories of economic development, but theories also of, of, of the ways in which societies and individuals function and what the implications are for those theories. And then also uh, some very detailed thinking about the role of public policy in trying to enhance, improve, get processes that will actually uh, meet the needs of populations uh, and be more inclusive. Um, it's a particularly a privilege to be able to present this study, partly because at Manchester with the Chronic Poverty Research Centre operating for about 10 years, and the very first things that we had to read were the earlier two books on Palampur to try and think about dynamics and particularly to uh, identify the pages on those that were looking at the dynamics to identify for poorer households and disadvantaged families and think about any of the evidence in those books about how families might escape poverty or why they were trapped in ways through economic processes or through social relations that did not allow them to take advantage of the emerging opportunities even when India was in a very Hindu growth, Hindu equilibrium um, phase of development. I think it's also really exciting, and I think we're going to hear a bit about it, but sometimes I get worried nowadays because when I talk with good economists I know, and I'm not a trained economist, but I know a little bit about economics, they tell me they're looking for a good data set to apply this really fascinating model or uh, set of equations they've got. And when I ask them about the quality of the data, they say, it's the best available. But if the best available is lousy, then actually you get lousy results no matter how sophisticated your analytical framework. It's a very different approach, taking a really long-term, longitudinal approach, uh, thinking about collecting data, thinking about the quality of data, thinking about how you get data that actually allows uh, for, for dynamics to be followed, for changes over time to be, uh, to be understood and explained. So I think we're going to really hear a lot today. We've got uh, Lord Professor Nicholas Stern, who's the IG Patel Professor of Economics and Government, uh, and chairman of the Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment, and head of the India Observatory at the London School um, of Economics. He's also been president of the British Academy from 2013 to 2017. Um, and also worked in the real world. Chief economist of the European Institute of Development in the 1990s. Chief economist and senior vice president of the World Bank, 2002-2003. Uh, so since as a second permanent secretary at the Treasury uh, and director of policy and research for the Prime Minister's Commission for Africa 2004-05, which produced uh, a, a very important study um, arguing about the ways in which certainly um, the UK and other countries could support African uh, development. He was knighted for his services to economics in 2004 um, and made a crossbencher life peer uh, as Baron Stern of Brentford in 2004. Seven. Professor Himanshu has a very long list, not quite as long as Nicholas is, but uh, he's got a couple of years to catch up yet uh, mm. on that. He's Associate Professor in Economics at the Centre for Economic Studies and Planning at the School of Social Sciences at Jawaharlal Nehru University, JNU. He's also a visiting uh, fellow at the Centre des Sciences Humaines and an associate at the Indra Observatory at LSE. And he uh, is particularly interested in poverty, inequality, employment, food security, and the processes of agrarian change that we're going to uh, hear about. He's been involved with the uh, Tandolka uh, Committee, the expert group on the measurement of poverty in India, which has been trying to understand some of the results and look at the ways in which poverty is measured um, in India. And he led the sixth round uh, of the survey at Palampur uh, in uh, Uttar Pradesh 
uh, which is the focus of the analysis that we've got um, in How Lives Change. Okay, can I Very pass good. the floor over to you? We'll have about half an hour at the end for questioning. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, David. Just checking the microphone. Still working? You all right there? Okay. And uh, let's try to use the um, cosy atmosphere to have a bit more time for uh, discussion at the, at the end. So we'll try to move fairly quickly. But it is a long story, and that's the problem. That the, the first book that we did on Palantor was 400 pages, and the second was 600. We thought things were getting out of hand, so the third book was 500 pages. It's a long, <laughs> it takes time to set uh, all this out. But um, it is important to have some interchange and we'll do our best to leave a good half an hour or so at the end. I will begin and um, uh, set the stage, the questions and how we went about it. And then um, Himanshu will do the guts. I, I nearly said the meat of the story, but uh, he's a vegetarian, but he, he will um, do the central part of the story, and I'll come back at the end to discuss, well, what have we learned in all this about the questions raised at the beginning. I wanted to start, though, with two personal observations. Um, those of you who lived and worked uh, in India uh, will recognize the name. More people should recognize the name. But last weekend, we lost T.N. Srinivasan and uh, he was a professor at, at Yale and uh, of great significance to this work because Tien, with Manmohan Singh, Tien uh, brought me to India in 1974 and it wouldn't have gone the way it did without Tien. It was very sad that uh, we lost him at the weekend. A really great development eco economist, a really great on the global stage and a really great Indian economist. The second is Arthur Lewis. It's wonderful to be here as a professor in the LSE speaking in Manchester because those were the two universities where Arthur Lewis um, worked when he was in the UK and indeed the only two uh, universities he worked in outside the Americas and the Caribbean. So um, my PhD thesis was an optimum growth model in a Lewis uh, context so and when I started as a graduate student it may surprise you that the uh, Arthur Lewis's great paper and book were only a dozen years old. It seems very distant now. Well, that's the passage of time. But it was very much alive uh, when I was a, a graduate student. He was a very big influence on us. I've worked a lot in China over the years. And in the last five years, I've worked 30 years in China, 45 years in India. And uh, in China, they're talking about the Lewis turning point They've been, last four or five years, they've been talking about the Lewis turning point. So he cast a very long shadow over me and the profession. Actually, a shadow is the wrong word. That sounds sinister. He, he inspired many of us, and he still inspires many of us. So uh, for TN and uh, Arthur Lewis, th this occasion means, means a lot. So let me describe very quickly um, the structure and then go th straight to the questions. That's the book. You'll notice that Peter Lanyau is the third author of uh, this book. He did his PhD on Palantor in the 1980s. He's stayed involved ever since. He's a professor at the uh, Free University of Amsterdam. This is the structure. I'll start with the ideas which we want to uh, analyze, then tell you a little bit about the different surveys over the years, and then hand over to him and Chu and come back at the end. So there's quite a bit of about the change in India. I won't go into the detail, but let's go straight to the questions in development economics. Um, the great classic, classical economist, Smith, Ricardo, Marx, and of course very much picked up by Kuznets and Lewis uh, in the uh, period after the Second World War, they were interested in what drives growth and what drives distribution and how do those processes interact? How do they go together? Those were the great big questions. And actually, in our subject economics, they got separated a bit. There were people who did growth and there were people who did distribution. And really, what the big questions of our time is how they go together. And that's what motivated us. It's what motivated Arthur Lewis. It's what motivated uh, Kuznets. And um, they were very much in the classical tradition. 
In the case of Arthur Lewis, absolutely explicitly so. He was discussing the relationship between his work and the work of uh, Marx and uh, Ricardo. Uh, Kuznets, of course, very much about structural change and what happens to people in the process of structural change, what happens to distribution of income. So they were, they were great economists, Kuznets and Lewis, in the classical uh, tradition. And what we've tried to do is to, in terms of the big stories, there'll, there'll be some very micro stories that we tell, but in terms of the big stories, uh, ask those questions. How does growth take place? And how does distribution move as growth play, takes place? How do they interact one with the other? So that will be absolutely key to our story, although we'll be pursuing it at a very micro level. But uh, we're trying to uh, go about this asking the uh, very big uh, questions. And we do think it's time that uh, our subject of economics brought back growth and structural change and distribution to the center of our subject, which is where they used to be and where they should be. Um, basically, how lives change is the question of development. Development is about, or should be about, how people's lives change. Now, sometimes we have to build that up from lots of different uh, micro-studies, but if we just do the micro-studies and don't build it up, then we miss the really big uh, questions. And we've tried to do both at the same time. We've tried to look at the way in which the micro-stories are behind the way in which people change their lives, the way in which people change what they do. And the way in which the overall economy changes has a profound effect on the circumstances in which they are working. Outside jobs have a profound effect on what happens inside the village, if you're thinking of the village economy of Palampur. So the village study allows you to look very intensively at one community, how it interacts one with the other, how people behave, how the markets work, how the institutions function, whilst you're asking the question, how does that village, as a microcosm of the country, how does that village grow? So you can see the, villages, the village study, the longitudinal village study, is the place where you can really go after these big questions which I've tried to pose, which we try to pose in, in the book, about the uh, growth of the economy, the distribution of the economy, and how that interacts with the micro, micro parts of the story, behavior, institutions, markets, and so on. And our view is that this is a very important way, not the only way, of course, but a very important way, much neglected in our subject, of taking those issues of um, how lives change, real development economics, uh, and putting them together in one story. So we do have uh, a, a, a whole chapter on Syria and India, which sets out and I've, I've sketched it very roughly, but sets out the kind of theoretical questions which uh, we're looking at here. But in this seminar, we're going to be focusing on mobility and inequality, mostly in income and wealth, a little bit about well-being as well. So there's lots, and here are some chapter references. There's lots on human development, chapter 9, lot on women, chapter 10, on society and politics, chapter 11, we will be drawing on those in weaving our story. But a much more intensive study is contained in those chapters. We can't talk about everything at once, but we didn't want to let that go and want to underline that there's lots in the book on these uh, broader dimensions. But we will draw them in as we tell the story of uh, income and mobility in relation to that story of um, mobility, inequality and... Uh, and so on. We also, in the book, speculate about the future. There's a book every 20 years. Um, I hope to be around for the next one. Um, and uh, each time we've speculated about where the future might go. And sometimes we've got it right. Well, each, each time, some dimensions we've got it right and some dimensions we've got it wrong. And it's quite interesting to, I mean, last time, for example, we speculated that education would become much more important. That was the 1998 <coughs> book. That was wrong. Education, in terms of income, is not particularly important in Palampur. You'll see it when we come to talk about the nature of the outside employment, and Himanshu will pick up much of uh, that. 
the outside activities that people get, which are extremely important to their lives, are not activities particularly where education matters much. But girls, you know, nearly all the girls are in primary school now. It's quite a recent phenomenon. Most of the boys have been in primary school for longer. Um, that, we would speculate now, will start to feed through. So it's the second time we've speculated that education is about to become important, but we're much more confident this time round than we were before. That's just one example of where we've got it wrong in the past. But that speculation is there. So I've tried to tell the story about why the village is a good microcosm to study the really big questions uh, in uh, development. Uh, obviously, there's a the key point that uh, most of Indians uh, live in rural areas. If you're interested in India, you have to be interested in village life because that's where the majority of uh, people are. It's still around two thirds of the population of India uh, live, in, uh, live in villages. So it's a big part of the story of the country as a whole, as well as, of course, being a little laboratory or microcosm, if you like, of, um, of study. If our big theories of development don't explain what happens in a not particularly peculiar village like Palanpur, then there's something wrong with those theories. Or you can say, if you start to discover what they miss out, you can start to build and add to those uh, theories. So that's the village study, and that's the kind of questions which uh, we're asking. Let me now turn to the story of the seven studies. Um, I'll be very quick, but um, why did we go, Christopher Bliss and myself, in 74-5 uh, um, to that particular village? Well, we were looking at the Green Revolution. We wanted to have somewhere that had been studied uh, before to look at the changes brought by the Green Revolution. There was lots of um, uh, theory around, uh, interesting theory around about land markets and labour markets, particularly associated with share tenancy. So uh, because it's Green Revolution, wheat had to be important. Because it's uh, share tenancy, we wanted somewhere with land markets, markets for the services of land were fairly active, not too far, not too close from Delhi, and uh, nothing particularly unusual about the village. You know, some villages are dominated by a group of weavers, and they wouldn't be very good places for looking at agriculture, which is what we were particularly interested uh, there. So nothing particularly unusual about the village. And very importantly, we wanted to live independently of any household, and we lived in the seed store, uh, rooms above the seed store, which had been left vacant by the village level worker, who was making a lot of money um, allocating uh, subsidized fertilizer and rationed fertilizer. So he did all right. He didn't want to live there. He lived in the nearby town, so we could live there independently of uh, any family. Uh, the studies, it had been studied before Palanpur by Agricultural Economics Research Center of the University of Delhi, actually very good studies by S.S. Chagi Sr., and we or led by, and we hired S.S. Chagi Jr. as our main research assistant. Fortunately, he looked rather like his brother, so when he came back to the village in 74-5, there was already a sort of trust and intimacy uh, uh, around uh, him. And then since 74-75, there's been a continuity of personnel. Um, now, very quickly, that's where Palanpur is, um, in Muradabad district of UP. Palampur is sort of in, on the west, on the east side of West UP. It sort of has a lot of features more East UP than West UP. It's a fairly backward uh, village, but uh, it is in Muradabad uh, district. Uh, UP, of course, 200 million people, very important part of the world. Um, 83, 84, the wonderful Jean Drez and Naresh Sharma joined us. They stayed in the village uh, even uh, longer and lots and lots, John kept a very detailed diary, lots more qualitative information in that study. Um, because we were being slow in analyzing our data and because uh, having done the 83 study in great detail, we picked up, we did a 93 quick study and the really the, by far the biggest study led by Him and Shu and really the last 10 years this work has been led by Him and Shu. Um, we, they were in the village for two years, very importantly many more women now, which meant that the data on women uh, were much better than uh, before. And uh, you, 
the two-year stay meant you could ask questions towards the end of the two-year stay that you couldn't ask at the beginning, including, for example, on domestic violence and uh, so on. And 2015, um, we had another quick survey, but this time it could be done <coughs> because everything's on tablets, and we had all the history of the previous surveys much more quickly. So we have very high-quality quantitative data and a very large quantity of qualitative data, and both of them are very important in understanding what uh, goes on. So here you are, a bit of picture here. Uh, you can see what I looked like in 1982. Um, same weight, but different hair color. And uh, SS Chagi Jr. in the middle, and BK Singh the other. Uh, so the green one is, that's the 1982 volume, it just when it uh, came out. And that's a team photo in 2009. Um, th there are very big differences. Palampur is still a very poor village, don't get us wrong. It's a very poor village, it's a hard way of living. But it's changed, and it's changed at a fairly modest rate, but it has changed. And if you stay there, with, we've got one study for every decade since independence, so that's seven of them, and that covers a period of 60 years. And uh, in 60 years, slow rates of progress make uh, add up to quite a lot. So there's the difference um, between um, a mud road and uh, a brick road in the village. And I tell you, when it rains, and of course it does rain very intensively during the monsoon period, there's a huge difference between a brick road and a mud road. And you can see the drainage on the, on the right side is much better than the drainage on the left. Uh, outdoor lessons in 83. Um, and. Uh, much better school buildings in 2009. There is change, but don't exaggerate, you shouldn't exaggerate. It is still a very uh, poor village. This was a village compound in 1974-5, everything done by hand, and this is a mentha. Mentha is mint. Um, the, uh, that's um, now an example of um, a mechanized pressing process. So that's the first part of the story. And now I hand over to um, Himanshu, who will do the core sets of results. And I'll come back at the end. Yeah. Thanks, Nick. <coughs> so let me uh, quickly run through what has happened uh, in the village in the last seven decades. Now, obviously, we are trying to tell a story about the last seven decades, which is a long period. Uh, and we have collected a huge amount of uh, information in between uh, in, the, in the village. So uh, I'll be brief about some of the things, but in the question answers, we can come back to it. But broad stories first, and then I go into the details of this. Palanpur is not so unusual, and it's very, very similar to what a normal village in uh, Western Uttar Pradesh would be. And in terms of uh, what India has seen in the last three decades, it's quite a, a rapid transformation in the sense that growth rates now are much higher than the, what they were in the first uh, three decades of it. And that's something which is you see in uh, Palanpur also. So on an average, around 2% per annum per capita is the rate of growth of income. Not very different from rural Uttar Pradesh in the western Uttar Pradesh in that sense. And that has led to a decline in uh, poverty also. These are things which are not very different and more or less well known as far as India is concerned. Non-farm activities have become much more important. And that's something which is, again, very similar to what is happening in India. And in, similar in the, in, the, in the distribution space of it, on which we'll come back uh, and, and discuss a little bit more. But just to tell you that this transformation that we have seen, uh, seen in, the, in the village in the last 30 years, or last seven decades to, taken together, the drivers have changed. And that has changed also the way the village groups or the various caste groups in the village have been affected by this. The first 30, 40 years were basically where agriculture played a big role. Green revolution was particularly important. Last 30 years are the years the non-farm sector has become more important as a driver of growth. Outside jobs have become an important driver of growth. And in the first year, when uh, first three decades, when Murao as the cultivating caste benefited a lot, in the last 30 years, the, uh, uh, the jataps, which are the so-called uh, untouchable caste or the scheduled caste, they have seen rapid improvement. And we are not saying that they have become rich and they are now the dominant caste in the village. But certainly, compared to the first three decades, their improvements are remarkable. And you can see that. It's something which is visible. On human development, again, uh, Nick has already spoken to you. And we have lots of details which are there in the book. And I wouldn't go and get into the details of it. But yes, just two points. One is that compared to the kind of economic growth that India has seen, or what Pila Palanpur has seen, 
uh, improvements in human development have been there very rapid in uh, some, some of the cases like education now 100 percent of the children are enrolled, but not exactly to the level that we would be happy with or any, any developing country would be uh, happy with the kind of a human development outcomes. But certainly there are changes and those changes need to be uh, understood and we try, do try and understand why it is happening and it has role being played by inequality, collective action, differential outcomes uh, across castes, by uh, gender groups, by different uh, population groups and we do talk a lot of, of these, but we will not be talking much about it. Say, uh, similarly on institutions of society which are important and we do play, uh, I mean we do bring them in the, in the mainstream discussion of when we are looking at the uh, various issues in the book and those are formal institutions as well as informal institutions. And we are looking at the whole, how the whole village society is structured, what kind of a cooperation is there, what kind of conflict is there, how is the Panchayati Raj system or the, the village elected council works, what is, the, what is happening to the village elected council over a period of reservation has played a role. Uh, political change outside the village, like say uh, emergence of a, a Bahujan Samaj party or the uh, Dalit chief minister, uh, women of Dalit chief minister has played a role, how has information technology has changed the role, how communication has changed the role, we look at all these issues. But we are also looking at institutions within the village, not just within the economic sphere of it, like the tenancy and other kind of labor markets, but also the links between the informal and the formal, the links between the land market and the labor market and the credit market. I mean, how those institutions are behaving and we find instances of collusion, we also find uh, instances of cooperation and all those things are there, but we will not be spending uh, much time on this. But we are happy to take questions on uh, some of these uh, issues. Uh, let me uh, give you a brief background of it. The village is not very big. It's around 1,300 uh, population is the, uh, of the village by 2015. And a growth rate of population has already uh, has, has been uh, going down as is happening in almost uh, all of India. Not as rapidly, but yes, it is now less than 2%. The four different groups, the dominant groups in the village are the Thakos, which are the caste hierarchy among the top. The Muraos are the cultivator caste, they are among the backward caste and they are the ones who take pride in being cultivators. The Jataps are the ones who are the scheduled caste, the untouchable caste and they are generally at the bottom of the caste hierarchy and they were also among the poorest households in the first three decades and today also they continue to be among the poorest households but they have seen substantial change in the way they, uh, they interact with the village economy but also outside. And then uh, there is a group which is Muslims, they are consisting basically of Dhobis and Telis, again uh, a group which is uh, there in, uh, uh, in, in Palanpur and share has a little bit uh, gone up. These are the four do dominant groups that we have in the village and there are smaller castes which are there. Uh, we talk about it in the, uh, in the book. Uh, if you look at the income uh, indicators of it, they are what we have already uh, described. So there is definitely an improvement over a period of time, not the same kind of improvement and one of the things that you must uh, uh, notice uh, you know, and take, take account of is that uh, the way our data points are structured, the way our survey points are structured, sometimes what appears may be driven by the fact the choice of the survey years. Some of the survey years are very good in terms of monsoon, some of the survey years are uh, deficient in terms of monsoon, but overall what we are presenting is a large story of a long period of time and you can see that there is a really a good kind of impro good improvement not just in uh, uh, income but also in terms of poverty, income per capita, product wages have gone up from around 2.5 in 1957-58 to almost like 9 uh, by 2008-9. Uh, uh, agriculture is, was the major issue of study for the 1982 book and it is something which continues to be important, although less so compared to what it was there in the earlier years. Agriculture has continued the trend of intensification of agriculture and mechanization of agriculture following the Green Revolution uh, period. Now the village is fully irrigated. Now the, there is 100% irrigation in the village and the intensity of irrigation has also gone up. There are much more bore, bore wells and their water has been, is being drawn out uh, uh, much more intensively than what, 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 was, what was the case in the 1970s and the 80s. Mechanization is now almost saturated in the village. There are number of tractors in the village is close to around 30 which is far more than what you would expect in a normal village in North Indian. Uh, context in an, in an area, but what these two have done is that the uh, productivity has obviously gone up in the village, more crops are being grown, grown in, the crop, uh, in, the, in the village, more commercial crops are being grown in the village, the cropping intensity almost doubled from 1.09 in 1957 to almost like 2 in by 2018 and there is an intensive cultivation uh, in, the, in the village that has gone on. Mechanization has also meant 
that now, at least after in the last 10 to 15 years, whereas earlier, because of the rising irrigation and rising cropping intensity, it was absorbing labor, now it is shedding labor. So now the labor absorption in agriculture is going down, and it is going down quite rapidly in the last, after, this is after, after 2009, but uh, we have data after 2015. And again, agriculture is not uh, employing as much labor per unit of hectare than it was uh, the, compared to uh, previous years. Result of this is that a lot of labor is now moving out of agriculture, and where are they going? And those are the issues that we come back to. But before that, just to give you uh, what is happening to the tenancy market, the, the land market, land market is also being affected. But labor market is being, being affected by the changing composition of, uh, changing absorption of labor in agriculture and non-agriculture, but also tenancy market. There is not much labor available to supervise that kind of tenancy in uh, arrangements which is required in a share cropping arrangement. So you can see that there's an increase in basically the cash rent kind of a thing, or for example, Chauthai, which is kind of a labor contract which has emerged. But it is changing and it is a dynamic institution. We do see lots of indigeneity uh, in terms of the way the institutions have evolved over a period of time. Same caste or the trust becoming an important factor in tenancy relationships in terms of uh, choice of partners uh, in the land market, in the labor market, as well as in the credit market, all three markets. Uh, but really the change that is drive, being driven in the last three decades, uh, at least that uh, four decades we can think of, is the non-farm. And this is something which is, let me, let me just say that the non-farm, the way we have looked at non-farm in the whole development literature, it's non-farm. It's up to starting from anything which is not farm. But non-farm is not a homogeneous entity. We are talking about manufacturing, construction, services, and it's quite a heterogeneous entity in itself. And we are trying to figure out as to how it has played, and it has played in a different way. The first wave of non-farm in the 1980s was something which was driven by more of manufacturing where people are going into factories, people were basically working in regular work, uh, as regular employment, as factory workers. But the recent wave of non-farm is basically being driven by outside jobs. Much of them, are, most of them are basically casual jobs. People are working as daily wage laborers or as self-employed, as working as uh, marble polishing units, brick kilns, as uh, head loaders in the uh, railway uh, uh, yards. And those are jobs which are now accessible to the village without migrating or without joining them on a permanent basis. But basically, you can go to the places and work and come back to the village. So commuting, as opposed to migration, has become a major feature of the way villagers in, the, uh, in, in Palanpur are accessing the outside jobs or the non-farm economy. I mean, that is also something which has improved the possibilities of the jatabs or the schedule castes to access a market which is so far uh, uh, within their, uh, not, not accessible to them, simply because the regular jobs required some kind of network, some kind of a connection, some kind of skills. But these jobs are ones which are available to a large majority of them, and they have used it to a big extent, as I'll show you recently. This is a chart just to give you that the number of activities that the villagers are engaged is, is increased. And this is not just true for one household where we were looking at the kind of uh, 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 activities they're involved in, but also, just to give you what we call as pluri activity. Most of the households in the village now are involved in some form of, ag some form of non agricultural activity. So, pure agricultural households, households which have only interested in, uh, only, only engaged in cultivation of uh, crops in the village, that's less than 10%. In fact, probably less than 6 to 7%. So, some of them, so within the households, there is a huge diversification that we see. And that pluri activity is now something which is very obvious in the last. Uh, 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 survey that the big survey that we had in 2008-9. So how did how did how did how did uh, people take uh, uh, take up these opportunities that was opened up by the outside jobs? Not everybody, as again I mentioned to you, the Thakurs, as I mentioned to you, were the, among the richest caste. They also were the caste group with the largest land holding. They were the most prosperous groups. In 1950s, 90% 90 of them were engaged in cultivation. Most of them were engaged in cultivation. By 2015, that number is less than one third. So less than one third of those among the Thakur group, or the topmost uh, caste group, are engaged in agriculture or in cultivation. But remember, the, just look at the purple, the, the, the one which is on uh, regular employment, and that number is now almost one fourth. And they are the ones who are still getting their access to the non-farm jobs, the good quality non-farm jobs, the stable quality of non-farm jobs. Similar kind of a diversification is also happening among Jatabs, who were almost like 90% in agriculture, and by 2015, their, uh, their share in the non agricultural sector has gone down to less than 20%. But they are now in the casual employment. They're basically working as casual workers. They're working as head loaders, they're working as brickle workers, they're working as marble polishers, repairs, mechanics, vendors, and those kind of things. 
So similar transformation, but the nature of non-farm jobs that they have taken up is quite different from the nature of non-farm jobs that have been taken up by the Thakur group. But Murao's, who were the biggest beneficiaries of the Green Revolution, and in fact one of the most uh, entrepreneurial class, if you look at it, the, their ability to look at the new technology that was brought in as part of the Green Revolution, they have been slow to take up the opportunities which have come from the non-farm sector. Still 50% of them are in the agricultural sector, whereas for all other sectors it has gone to less than 30%. So they are again very similar to the story that you see, and again is a point to remind that the story of Palanpur is not just the story of Palanpur, but something which resonates on a larger scale. If you are following what is happening in India, large number of these agricultural communities are now on the street demanding for reservation in political jobs. The Marathas, the Jats, and the Patels. And they're all industrial agricultural groups, which are now finding that the jobs in agriculture are not paying that much, and they are trying to move out of the non-agricultural sector. But the Murals have continued to remain in agriculture in a big way, very little regular employment, even though in terms of economic status and land, activity, land, land that they hold, they are very similar to the Thakurs in the 1950s and the 60s. But they have not been able to take up the opportunities in the non-agriculture non sector the same way as the Thakurs. That brings to the question of mobility and poverty. And I would like to emphasize here the, I mean, what, what we are trying to present here is not just the basic aggregates. That's not the purpose of uh, presenting this data. We are not interested only in the level of the poverty, but actually what is driving? Who are the people who are moving up? Who are the people who are moving down? That's what the question that we next started with is how lives change. Which are the, how, do, how do people take up opportunities and how does uh, uh, some groups move up, some groups move down? So the, if you look at just the broad story of the 70 years and break it down into two parts, one part is the when the agriculture was driving it and the Murals and the Thakurs benefited out of it. The second part when the non-agriculture sector was moving up and the other caste, the Muslims and the Jatavs basically moved up in the, uh, and, and taken, took up the opportunities in the non-agricultural sector. Overall, poverty has declined, as you can see, which is, which is expected given the kind of a sustained growth in per capita income that has happened over a period of time, but it is not the income which defines your ability to. There are many, many things which are involved in this. And so to understand what, what is it that is driving mobility of households, people, households moving up and households moving down, look at different ways of uh, uh, ranking households. One of the ways that we do it, and we use a lot of these qualitative informations, is for example, what we, the term that was used by John Drez, and again Nick was part of the whole uh, study, the 1998 one, is we use the word observed means. And the observed means are not the means, meaning, means doesn't mean averages here. They're looking at observed means in the sense means of livelihood. And those are the ones where the resident investigators, people who are staying in the village for 15 months or 20 months or two years, did an assessment of each of the households and ranking of the households in different categories, whether they're poor or very poor or rich or prosperous or in different categories. We use that information with the quantitative information that came from consumption and income and to get an assessment of who is moving up and who is moving down. And that gives a very uh, different kind of an assessment. But just to say that even though we use different uh, 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 metrics, different rankings, and they sometimes do not talk to each other, there is still a good amount of convergence in terms of the basic trends that they throw up. So even though it doesn't appear to be very, very high correlation among the various rankings, but if you're looking at the top people, people who moved up, people who have moved down, there might be some kind of a overlap in the middle, but overall you see a trend which gives us a flavor of what is happening. So I'll give you one example of what kind of an exercise that can be done from the Palanpur exercise. This is uh, by per capita income classification of households in 1983-84. So the, by uh, different caste groups. And we have classified them in five different groups. Very poor, poor, secure, prosperous, and rich. So this is like a quintile uh, that you can bring in. Look at the Moraos who are in the very poor and the poor group. Roughly like say one fourth are there in the by per capita income classification. But almost three fourths of them are there in the secure, prosperous, and the rich group. When you come to the Jatabs, you find that almost 100% of them, exactly all, in all 100% of them, are there in the very poor, poor and the secure group, not a single one of them in the prosperous and the rich group. That is in 1983-84. If you use the same per capita ranking in 2008-9, you see a change. Now you can see that the number of, uh, uh, um, in the, almost like two-thirds of the Murao households now are within the very poor, poor and the secure group, whereas the Jatabs have moved almost 20% of them. So 20% of the households are now in the prosperous and the rich category. Quite a change from the 1983-84 when there was not a single household in the secure. But this is the same thing we can do, the same exercise we can do it by looking at the observed means. 
The absorbed means are obviously looking at assets, your wealth position, your household size, your composition, your cost, and different uh, factors go into assessing households. Similarly, in the 90, I mean, if you look at it by absorbed means classification 1983-84, not a single Morao household was deemed to be poor and very poor. And not a single household in Jatams was seen to be rich or, uh, or, 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 or uh, uh, prosperous in 1983-84. By 2008-9, you can see that they are far more spread out. The Muraos are far more spread out. There are now households in the Muraos, almost one-fourth of them in the very poor and the poor group, where none was there in the 1983-84. And similarly, in the Jatams, there is nobody who is rich in that sense, but there are lots who have moved into the prosperous and the secure group. And that's the kind of a change you see that is confirmed by different measures of it. And we have six measures of ranking households, and we use all of this combined information to arrive at uh, who is moving up, who is moving down. But this is also a period when there is a huge mobility, but inequality has gone up, and inequality has uh, uh, moved up uh, by all measures of it. We look at, again, using the same kind of a thing. So we can now classify households who are there in 1983, or in 57, or 2008-9, and we took two groups. The first group is 1987, uh, 88 to 83, the 25-year period, and 83 to 2009, again a 25-year period, which is a father-son kind of a combination. So split households which have been. And then we track those households. Who are the households where the ranks have moved out? And we can do a match one-to-one -one match of these households. So this is a matching that is between 1950s and 1980s. And you can actually look at which are the households which have moved up, which are the households which have moved down, what are the characteristics of these households, what is it that changed to bring this mobility in these households. We are interested in the ones which are the bottom corner and the top corner. The diagonal ones are where the rankings have remained the same. And you can do the same kind of an exercise between 83 to 2008-9. And see, again, look at the households very closely, their characteristics, and what is it that drove them to. So we do this kind of an exercise. Between 2008-9 and 83 and 2008-9, you can see that the downward mobility among Muraws is much higher compared to Thales and Jatavs, where upward mobility is quite higher. And we get the same result when we do it by, per, uh, by consumption or we do it by income. And we look at very closely and we do find that these have been, households have been able to take up these opportunities in a bigger way and have been able to, have been more successful in using this opportunity that's opened up by the economy, opening of the uh, economy after 1991. Now this is a story where we are saying that inequality has gone up, but at the same time mobility has gone up. And there's no contradiction in this, by the way. They're both consistent. I mean, one way to look at this whole story is that, I mean, we know about this Great Gatsby curve, that societies with higher inequality are also where mobility is low. And that's something which is the, great, the famous Great Gatsby curve. I mean, societies with lower inequality do have higher mobility. That is, the intergenerational elasticity of income is lower in those cases. And this is something that we find in, uh, in the case of Palanpur also. So we look at incomes and match them with the fathers and the grandfathers, and we do see that the intergenerational elasticity has gone up, I mean, whichever way we are looking at it. So this is something where we, we, we uh, so, so this is something again which is consistent with what we find in the village, that there is some kind of stickiness as far as within group inequality is concerned, within, within group transmission of uh, income is concerned. But as a group, Jatabs and Telis have taken up the opportunities where the Moravs are less willing to move up into those opportunities. It is the changing nature of the opportunities. It is also the changing uh, 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 role of the various castes and the relationship within the caste of different groups. And that's a fascinating story of what brings us uh, into uh, uh, this analysis of structural change, development, the micro stories, the household level stories, the behavioral stories, linking it with the institutional stories and linking with the larger stories of growth and structural change. I'll end with just two uh, stories of uh, the kind of richness of the data. So for example, this uh, household, the Teli household, the Muslim, the Muslim households, which have moved up, this is a household which is ranked among the poorest in the 1950s and the 60s. But then this guy, the household head, who had various uh, uh, um, accidents in the households in the 1950s and uh, 60s, did start taking up uh, opportunities that was opened up in the non-farm sector. He started becoming, he trained as a mechanic, and then he opened up a mechanic shop and a repair shop, and then he st st started moving into um, oil pressing, and the mentha mill that you see in the pictures that Nick was showing, that belonged to him. So he was, he took the opportunities, brought in people there, and then he is now among the richest households in the village. On the other hand, this household, Pasi households, which was among the better of households in the village, had an accident because somebody went into, not an accident in the sense, but I mean, one of the families, uh, I mean, they, within the family, the brothers started drinking, gambling. I mean, this can, this can happen to any households. And they suddenly frittered away everything, and they had to finally leave the village. But this kind of a 
uh, uh, where, where households suddenly going from a high uh, status to going to low status can happen because of medical illness, some uh, household head again suddenly dying, court cases or any other uh, uh, involvement in uh, 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 these accidents. The, what distinguishes these households from the other households is their ability to manage the risks and their ability to take opportunities which are available to them. So again, these are individual stories in that sense. They're very uh, detailed stories, but they're also linked to the kind of opportunities that have been opened up by the larger economy, what is happening within the village, what is happening outside the village. And that's where we bring in our, uh, uh, the, 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 the seven decades of the story to answer some of these questions where uh, I'll, I'll bring back Nick to try and answer these questions. Thank you, Himanshu. So let me come back now to the last uh, few slides, which take what Himanshu has been saying and relate it to the questions which uh, we posed at the beginning, the big questions of development economics, how lives change, how growth mm. takes place, how growth and distribution interact with each other, together with the very micro stories of how different kinds of markets work how the function of those markets are influenced by the changing opportunities and how the functioning of those markets influence people's abilities to take those opportunities. So first, let's, I won't dwell on it, but just to emphasize that without the kind of data that we have, we couldn't have grappled with those kinds of um, questions. And there was huge, I won't go on about it, but there's just huge investment in putting those kinds of data sets uh, together. Um, you have to really be very fussy about data quality. You have to constantly uh, do the checking. One of the sort of uh, reality checks that we did, um, of course, uh, you focus very much on data within the village, but we looked across at other village studies, him and Shu himself with um, Jar and Rogers, um, uh, edited a book on the changing village where we brought lots of other longitudinal studies together uh, to compare with what we had. Um, to be frank, the, the richness of the Palampur data in terms of one for every year since independence is not something that you can find anywhere else. There are some very valuable longitudinal studies, but I don't think anything of the richness of the Palampur uh, data. So secondly, we have the uh, growth story. Now, Lewis and Kuznets, um, the story of the transformation from a backward sector into a more advanced capitalistic se sector is a very partial and flawed description of what we have in Palampur. But the big story of the movement out of agriculture as time goes by is a good story. It's the way it happens that doesn't fit so well with the stories that they were telling. The Kuznets insight that some people get richer before others so that as outside opportunities develop, inequality goes up. So that mobility, that form of mobility in taking outside jobs leads to an increase in inequality is very important. We call it the Kuznets insight because the actual model that he tells of people moving out of the rural areas into the towns is not the story that we find. We find a commuting story, pluriactivity, not one day you leave that sector, the next day you go to the other sector. It's a very different story. It's people doing piecework, part of their time, many activities, moving out of agriculture in that sense. The Kuznets Lewis story is not a story of a backward sector with no capital investment. Indeed, there's very strong capital investment in agriculture, and the, one of the effects of that is to release labor to go outside agriculture. So the Kuznets Lewis stories have very good elements to them, but they actually don't tell you the story of the process of development that we see in Palampur in some very important respects. And it's not just Palampur, this is true of many other villages in the Indo-Gangetic Plain, and just to re-emphasize, 200 million people in UP, we're talking, and lots of villages, not unlike Palampur, so we're talking about a big story of um, development here. So that's the uh, growth story. Agriculture, well, I won't dwell on agriculture, but um, there are some fascinating interactions between technology, 
society and factor allocation. Um, as, let me just give you one very quickly. Um, it, in the early days, or the first part of our story, the ploughing was done with draft animals, with bullocks or he buffaloes. And that uh, meant that if you did not have those draft animals, you could not be a credible tenant to lease in land. Because you couldn't hire in those animals, because the person who possessed the animals, who might be thinking of renting them out to you, would not rent them to you alone because you might not look after them properly. Neither would he come and work on your land with those animals because it would be a bit like working for you and that would be degrading. So you couldn't get in to the tenancy market. That's a social constraint. But then the technologies change and tractors come along. Now the guy who's got the tractor, he's perfectly all right sitting way up high on his tractor and uh, driving it around. He's quite a high status tractor fellow. It's his tractor, he's driving it, that's fine. So if you've got a bit of money, and now the Jatabs, the lower groups, did have a bit of money from the outside jobs, you could now rent in land because you were credible. Credible in terms of your liquidity and you could hire in the services. So it's a rather interesting interaction between the, um, the economic and the social and the technological which allow people into land markets which they couldn't do before. And of course uh, what you've got then at the same time as uh, Himanchu emphasized, you've got changing structure of the rental contracts too. So it's the endogeneity of institutions. The outside job enabled people to get into markets that they couldn't get into before. And then the, the way those markets work, the institutional structure of those markets changed. And you couldn't really understand all that without the close study of the village. Lots more on uh, agriculture too, but uh, I won't dwell. Now the mobility story we found to be fascinating. Um, and let me just emphasize one thing. And that is that in the early part of the period, and I'm just emphasizing what, drawing out things from what Himanshu said. In the early part of the period, the story of advance was a story of advance within agriculture. What advance? The advance was largely investing in irrigation. There's a huge difference between double cropping and single cropping. Uh, without irrigation, double cropping, taking two crops a year, uh, and then increasingly wheat and rice, for example. Um, wheat in the winter season, rice in the um, uh, summer season or Karif season. And um, that, of course, is a big change in your income, a big change in your economic activity. And it comes from investment in agriculture through largely irrigation. So what happened in the earlier part of the period is that those who did not have irrigation invested in irrigation and they caught up. So you had a story then of people being entrepreneurial and taking these opportunities. So they were mobile in that sense, they were entrepreneurial in that sense, and it led to some decrease in inequality because it was catch up. The second part of the period, you know, from the mid 80s, the story was much more outside activities, outside uh, jobs. And there, in the uh, immortal words of Deng Xiaoping, some people get richer before others. That's the Kuznets insight. That's the Deng Xiaoping insight. Um, and then the entrepreneurial activity and the mobility led to increase in inequality. So if, whether or not uh, increased mobility leads to increase or decrease in inequality depends to a very substantial extent on the nature of the opportunities which are available at the moment, how that economy is changing in those periods of time. So it's a very important, and then we're, we're not advertising inequality, but what we are saying is that this period of mobility as people move up and out of agriculture, which for some castes, you know, opened opportunities they didn't have before, is a period of change. It's a period of positive change in the sense of rising income, but it comes with inequality. Now that's not saying that inequality is a good thing, that we're coming out in favour of inequality, but you've got to understand the processes at work if you want to comment on inequality. 
Um, and that is, I think, uh, you know, poses some quite interesting questions, challenges for us in the way in which we think about inequality. In, we saw, of course, that whilst the within caste in it, within caste variation was very important, and there was big variation within caste in entrepreneurial and uh, activities, investing in different ways, there were also important differences across caste. So this entrepreneurial activity, this distribution, if you like, of entrepreneurial activity is a distribution which is affected by your social circumstances. Some people are able, or some groups, are more advantaged than others in taking these new opportunities, even though the within-group uh, variation is very strong. Um, lots about institutions and behaviour. Um, Zamandari abolition, which gave land to the tenant in the early 1950s in UP, did work reasonably well in Palampur, and that enabled a lot of the investment in agriculture. So where previously the, the zamindar was essentially the owner of the land, it wasn't your land, you were just a tenant, now it was your land and you were much more likely to invest. Institutional uh, change really did affect uh, investment. And I've already given the example of um, the social constraints of um, working for others in the period where ploughing was done by draft animals had a powerful effect on what opportunities were av available to the lower groups in the uh, social structures. So institutions do matter to economic opportunity, but also institutions change. Institutions are uh, endogenous in the, uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the jargon. And I think entrepreneurship is probably underplayed in our stories of development. This is not entrepreneurship of the Silicon Valley, uh, Bangalore kind. This is poor people recognizing opportunities and taking risks in order to take those opportunities. Recognizing opportunities and taking risks to grasp them seems to me to be a reasonable use of language when we're talking about uh, entrepreneurship. Society, we ha there's a lot in the book on that and we haven't said much about it not because we think it's unimportant, we, we decided that we'd do the inequality mobility story uh, for this, uh, this event. But the position of girls and women is still very heavily constrained. There is important stuff there about, uh, for example, domestic violence. Finally, it's uh, the education position for girls is changing, way behind the boys, but nearly all the girls are in school now in... Uh, nearly all the primary age girls are in school in Palampur. And that's a reason that we think that the um, role of uh, education in the life and future of Palampur is finally becoming, going to become important, even though it's been of marginal importance in the, uh, in the past. Marginal importance to the getting of um, uh, gainful uh, activity. I mean, if you're making bricks in a brick kiln, if you're moving uh, bags out of the um, uh, out of the rail wagons into the uh, into the station, those are not jobs for which those are piece rate jobs. Those are not jobs for which you uh, edu which education is going to be of great uh, importance. So um, that's one of our predictions. Uh, our observation is it hasn't been terribly important. The prediction is it's about to become important. We qualify that with, we made a similar prediction 15 or 20 years ago, but finally we think, if you stay with the same prediction for long enough, sometime it's going to come right. But I think I've given you reasons to believe it might come right uh, this, time, uh, this time round. But we do have a chapter on future prospects, so you can see how we've stuck our neck out this time. Um, but we do begin the chapter on future prospects, pointing out what we got wrong and what we got right, when in the past we've written chapters on... Uh, future prospects. So this is finally uh, just emphasising the kinds of points I've been trying to make. Um, surely development should be about how lives change and why some people advance more quickly uh, than others. We should go back to the great uh, classical, and we include now Lewis and Kuznets in that tradition, we should go back to classical tradition and look at growth and distribution uh, together. Um, we've we're really, really convinced of the quality of data and how, how important that is. 
Well, we would say that, wouldn't we, because we've invested so much time in doing it. But you do find, after a few months, that you really do get right who is farming the land and who isn't. Where if you breezed in and breezed out, you simply would get so much of it wrong. And uh, that's a very important lesson. You can't really understand how the social interactions affect economic outcomes and how economic outcomes affect social interactions unless you sit and watch and observe and do qualitative data as well as quantitative data. So as I said earlier on, we have high quality quantitative data and we have a high quantity of qualitative data and both of those really uh, matter to the, uh, to the story. So we've tried to go to the big questions. We've gone about it in a very micro and intensive way, but uh, as my research supervisor, Jim Merlees, who sadly died earlier this year, told me at the beginning of the PhD thesis, is uh, you've got to think big and work small. And we think big and work small, and then go back to thinking big, and that's what we've tried to offer you uh, today. So thanks very much uh, on behalf of him and Shu and myself. Okay, we've got about half an hour for uh, questions. Hey, man, sure. um, and I, I think, yeah, we should, we should have got your seats, but if you can yeah. stand you at the front and let's see if I can will this wretched thing go down out of the way. Can we stand over here? We, uh, we, yeah, we've, yeah. we've both got the mic, so. Um, yeah. Okay, that's good on that. Um,